Hello, welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Young Gyo Kim. North Korea has held speed up missile tests this year, and many speculate North Korea's provocations will continue. Amid this, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said it has yet to be proven whether North Korea can make a nuclear warhead to an intercontinental ballistic missile and make it reach the continental United States, but warned North Korea will likely continue testing its nuclear and missile programs in the coming months. Today, we'll discuss these and more. Joining me is Melissa Hannum. Ms. Hannum is an independent expert on North Korea's weapons of mass destruction, currently affiliated with Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. David Schmarler is also with me today. He is a senior research associate at the Middlebury Institute's James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. His area of study includes North Korea's missile and nuclear programs. Welcome to the show. Good to have you both today. Thanks for having us on. South Korean President-elect Yoon Song Yeol's transition team recently visited Washington, D.C., and Song Kim, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, has been quite occupied meeting the new South Korean team, his Chinese counterpart, and he even talked with the Japanese side. And now he's traveling to Seoul amid growing speculation of additional provocations. Ms. Hannum, do you expect to see more provocations in coming days? Yes, I think uh, that we're likely to see additional missile tests, and uh, there's been activity at the Pyongyang nuclear test site as well, which suggests that they may be tunneling a little bit in order to reopen one of the unused tunnels at the site. So there are likely going to be more activities, particularly around the upcoming uh, military anniversary on the 25th. Mr. Schmerler, has North Korea got a lot more to test? Nuclear programs um, outside of North Korea have conducted uh, hundreds of, of tests to ensure the reliability and the technical specification of the nuclear weapons that they're developing. So North Korea certainly does, if the past president holds true, have plenty more tests that they can conduct to make their systems more reliable. Mm -hmm. When we look back at the missiles North Korea launched this year, there was a variety of missiles. Some of them showed advancement, and one of them apparently exploded. exploded. Uh, Mr. Schmerler, what impressed you most among those missiles that North Korea has tested? North Korea has been, at least optically from what we're seeing, um, trying to uh, diversify the types of tests that they can conduct with the systems that they already have. I, that that's just interesting, and it's probably going to set a trend for where they move forward. It it, it appears that they've um, increased the size of the Hwasong uh, 15 uh, for whatever project they're working on forward. So that's probably the uh, newest development that we've seen. Ms. Hannah, what is your assessment on their advancement? Did a specific missile show more advancement than the others? I, I mean, I think there are several different missile programs that are advancing all at the same time. It's uh, surprising that North Korea is able to advance on so many different levels. So we've seen short range missiles, which are likely dual capable, meaning they can be conventional or hold a nuclear warhead. These are uh, solid fuel missiles and um, means they can launch them very quickly. At the same time, we've seen this really kind of James Bond looking rail launched missile, which isn't really um, an advanced missile, but it's cleverly hidden so that it's harder for satellites to track it. And then last, you've mentioned the ICBM development. So we're now seeing that they're putting out these really heavy, really large ICBMs that aren't let's say technologically advanced like you would expect from the United States or Russia, but have so much size and fuel that they can you know, go a very long distance and carry a very heavy weight. So the concern about this new testing is that they might be able to put more than one warhead on, a, a, more than one nuclear warhead on the missile, meaning that um, these missiles become able to launch multiple targets. Ms. Hannum, how far has the North Korean technology come in terms of uh, re-entry, miniaturization, or multiple warheads? I'm asking this because these technologies are considered crucial for North Korea to make their missile reach the United States. 
It's a really difficult question for open source analysts like Dave and I to answer because there isn't any sort of physical evidence that we can examine from a distance. So truthfully, we cannot say definitively whether they have perfected miniaturization or they've perfected reentry. That being said, it's truly not the most difficult technology in the ICBM to develop. So I think that as a matter of policy, even if you don't have physical evidence before you to assume they can do reentry, we should still assume that it is done because the other parts of the ICBM are much more difficult to achieve than the reentry problem. Um, the only way that Kim Jong Un could prove that he has done this is by launching a nuclear warhead, and nobody wants that. Mr. Schmerler, United States National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said whether North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile can reach the continental United States with a warhead on it is not yet proven. What does this mean? Is this because they need to do more to perfect technologies involving reentry or miniaturization? I think um, that assessment is, is based off of the uh, past program in the United States where they had conducted hundreds, uh, if not more, tests to increase the reliability of the missile system. So comparatively, it looks a lot less reliable to what we would see in the United States, France, Russia, or, or China. But um, I'm not necessarily sure if that's some si uh, sort of um, point that we can find um, comfort in. In the meantime, the U.S. Defense Ministry's Defense Intelligence Agency noted in its latest report, Challenges Security in Space 2022, that North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un is stressing the country's space capabilities. Mr. Schmaler, why is Kim Jong-un doing this? What is Kim Jong-un's motive behind stressing the space program? The developments you can um, achieve or, or just develop in space exploration do have a dual use nature for the weapons program. And then there's also the fact that uh, spacefaring nation status is a prestige uh, point. So I think that uh, it serves two points for the North Koreans. One, just to achieve that status, which is something that we see in other countries like Iran and they're having on and off difficulty with it, but also it allows them to potentially test uh, technologies that would go on their ICBM program. So does that mean North Korea's space program is actually about developing ballistic missiles? I think it, it, it was. And now that they have developed the ballistic missiles, because we're far beyond the age of the um, UNHA-3, which was a series of Soviet Scud missiles stacked on top of each other, uh, to the point where they can try to actually retroactively take their weapons program and put that towards space exploration. Mm -hmm. or in space. Ms. Hannum, how seriously should we take North Korea's space capabilities? Well, North Korea really wants the prestige, as Dave said, of a space program. And they've probably seen, you know, in the United States, in the Soviet Union, and in China, how much the people embraced things like landing on the moon. So as Dave said, now that they've really developed an independent ICBM capability, I think they are looking to space now and using their ICBM capability to do things like develop uh, satellites and launch them. Um, I think just a few weeks ago, there were statements in state media that North Korea intended to plant a flag on the moon. But you know that is for the, the propaganda value, just as China has made similar plans or in the United States did it in the 60s. This is to cause people to, to sort of unify and celebrate technological capabilities of North Korea. And the DIA report also mentioned that North Korea's ballistic missiles and satellite launch vehicles, such as the UNHA-3, in theory could be used to target satellites in conflict. Uh, Ms. Hannah, what does this mean? They're talking about the counter space capability, right? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the big important parts of a U.S. allied attack uh, on North Korea would be communication. Mm -hmm. And some of that communication happens in space. And so uh, having a, a counter space capability is something that North Korea is interested in. 
I do think that North Korea has other priorities probably ahead of this. So while the report focuses on space, I think that this particular report was, you know, tasked with emphasizing space capabilities. Mm -hmm. I do kind of expect to see other um, capabilities focused on before counter space. Could you give us examples of it? So um, North Korea has uh, short range solid fuel missiles, which they're um, trying to improve the um, we call the circular error probability, the CEP. So the, the guidance needs to be worked on. Um, they have cruise missiles that they're developing. I think the um, ICBM uh, hitting the mainland US, all of these things probably take priority over anti-space capabilities, mm -hmm. but um, space is still something that is um, important in warfare, increasingly important in warfare. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's not, impossible to rule out that they would want to hit a communication satellite in, in particular, but um, being able to hit a satellite is, it does involve some pretty good accuracy and calculation. And so I think that they're going to probably be targeting land, ship, aircraft before they focus on space. I see. Uh, Mr. Schmarler, do you agree? Like, do, do you have any thoughts about North Korea's uh, counter space abilities? Everything Melissa said, um, I, I agree with. I think the mention to do that is more of a long term ambition, uh, but not necessarily something that we need to worry about in the short term. Mr. Schmarler, many suspect that North Korea couldn't have done all this on its own. Did North Korea rely on the Chinese technology or the Russia technology for its missiles and space programs? North Korea's early missile program was built off of uh, Soviet technology, and they certainly have, at least uh, from the evidence that I've seen, reached out to try to uh, not reinvent the wheel, but take things that have worked and integrate it into their own program. Uh, specifically, which missiles and which programs, which production facilities, um, I'm not quite sure, but um, it, it is apparent in the development of the program. So, Ms. Hanna, it was more about Russian technologies rather than Chinese. So, as Dave mentioned in the early years, um, you know, sort of through the uh, through the eighties, they were uh, readapting Soviet Scud missiles and kind of elongating them to make what we call the Nodong missile. And then, when you look at the Unha three series of um, space launch vehicles. They've really, what they've done is grouped multiple um, of these Nodong missiles together to make a more powerful, but um, it's it's not as efficient. It works, but it's not as efficient because of the fuel that the SCUD uses and the weight that grouping all of these things together. It's kind of like a brute force approach. Mm -hmm. And the Unha 3, while you know many people thought of it as potentially an ICBM, it's not really advantageous kind of ICBM because it takes a little while to stack it all up and everyone can see it <laughs> in satellite images while they do it. Mm -hmm. So these new road mobile missiles, the Hwasong missiles, which are you know um, using more energetic fuel that can go farther and faster than the kind of kerosene based fuel of the scuds. And then um, they're because they're on these mobile trucks, they can be launched, uh, you know, they're erected and launched more quickly than you would at the Sohei space station, for example. So they make um, uh, better ICBMs, but we haven't seen as much specific Russian or, or Chinese technology in these new missiles. You know, by the time they were developing these uh, Hwasong-14, Hwasong-15, Hwasong-17s, they had already imported quite a few machine tools from other countries. And so they began indigenously producing materials to use in those missiles. So, I mean, I think you could say a lot for Russian uh, design in the, in the beginning of their missile program, but more and more they focused on uh, being independent and not relying on the um, importation of devices that might be cut off or might be in short supply. They really wanted to be self-reliant and be able to produce them themselves. So unfortunately, those machine tools 
were the thing we really wanted to keep out of North Korea and uh, didn't happen. Mr. Schumerler, I understand that you've been watching North Korea closely through satellites. And recently, there have been many news reports that North Korea might be preparing for a nuclear test. What is your observation on that? We were always, uh, in the open source uh, think tank community, curious as to the extent mm -hmm. of the commissioning of their nuclear test site. Uh, we saw a lot of flashy explosions, and the North Koreans made quite an event of it. But we had no actual data as to how much of the tunnels that they had destroyed and whether or not that the level of destruction was reversible. And it appears that the North Koreans are now trying to tunnel in from a adjacent angle to recommission the tunnels that they can use for testing. Mr. Schmerler, there have been some speculations that North Korea could be preparing to test its miniaturized warhead at the nuclear facilities. Is it one of the possibilities? We can tell that they are um, attempting, they probably will do, because um, they've done this in the past, uh, to recommission the site so that they have the option to test nuclear weapons in the future. This is anybody's guess, but do you expect to see any uh, nuclear tests anytime soon? I don't see why they would try to recommission the test tunnels if they weren't planning on doing it. The question is uh, when, and, and we're not quite sure. Ms. Hanam, under these circumstances, how can the U.S. and its allies protect themselves? So, I mean, protecting yourself from a nuclear test is very difficult. And uh, it's any, any state that has the power to launch nuclear weapons is a deep concern. Um, in my opinion, you know, most of the work needs to be done beforehand in a way that makes sure that the missile carrying a nuclear warhead doesn't leave Earth. <laughs> so uh, I do believe strongly that we should be engaging North Korea in discussions and trying to prevent that missile from launching in the first place. After the fact, it becomes much more difficult. Obviously, the South Koreans have invested heavily in THAAD, and um, the Japanese have also invested in a ballistic missile defense. But um, with this, you know, with this, the complexity of stopping a missile in such a short amount of time, it really should not be relied upon as the main method of preventing uh, harm to allies in the region. Instead, we really should be focusing on ways to make North Korea feel like they are in not such so much threat that they need these things in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a very difficult diplomatic procedure that has been you know, starting and stopping for decades. And so I recognize that this creates a lot of frustration for the public in those in those countries. It's difficult to intercept such missile once it's launched. Is that right? Yes. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we've, we've seen um, missile defense work in the Middle East and we've seen it fail in the Middle East. And, you know, when you're talking about an ICBM, you have more time to calculate um, where the missile is coming from, how long it will be until it gets there. Um, and the U.S. Has, has various programs to try to intercept multiple times. But when you're in South Korea or Japan, the flight time is so short that you really have many fewer oppor opportunities to try to intercept it. And North Korea has been working quite hard on making maneuverable warheads for their short-range missiles, which make it even more difficult because the, it's not a traditional curve that you can sort of say, oh, well, I... I've calculated extremely quickly that it started here and it will end here. But once you have this maneuver, you can't necessarily guess exactly where it's going to come down. So it can it can make it very difficult for uh, South Korea and Japan to feel as confident. And that's North Korea's goal. North Korea's goal is to create this kind of terror and uncertainty. Um, and so. In my opinion, although it, it's not appealing to negotiate with an adversary, particularly an adversary with a human rights record and a leadership that has been so unappealing, but that is the, the most 
beneficial way, in my opinion, to try to prevent the missile from ever leaving the ground. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schmerler, what worried you uh, in terms of uh, the capabilities that North Korea have been, has been showing so far? And what, to what extent the U.S. and the allies should be prepared? Ultimately, I think this does, like uh, Melissa said earlier, boil down to a diplomatic um, effort and the attempts to find a technological solution to any offensive capabilities that the North Koreans have uh, is not 100% reliable. So I think the attention does need to double back to what type of diplomatic effort we can make to ease tensions between North Korea and the rest of the world. According to South Korean news media, the U.S. and South Korea have been in talks to hold a summit between U.S. President Joe Biden and South Korean President-elect Yoon suk yeol around May 21st, as President Biden is widely expected to visit Japan for a quad summit that week. Many are curious to find out how the two leaders will work together as the two countries face a number of imminent challenges. Ms. Hannum and Mr. Schmerler, Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis.